here is a collection of five of the top creepypastas I've posted lately, some ranging from quite a while back. I thought I'd put them all into one video so you can sit back, relax, and enjoy. If you'd like to see more of my content, be sure to subscribe. I upload new videos every week. But with that said, let's jump into the first story. Ben Drowned Post 1 September 7th, 2010 Okay, I need your help with this. This is not a copypasta. This is a long read, but I feel like my safety or well-being could very well depend on this. This is video game related specifically Majora's Mask, and this is the creepiest shit that has ever happened to me in my entire life. Having said that, I recently moved into my dorm room, starting as a sophomore in college, and a friend of mine gave me his old Nintendo 64 to play. I was stoked, to say the least. I could finally play all those old games of my youth that I hadn't touched in at least a decade. His Nintendo 64 came with one yellow controller and a rather shoddy copy of Super Smash Bros. And while beggars can't be choosers, needless to say, it didn't take long until I became bored of beating up level 9 CPUs. That weekend, I decided to drive around a few neighbourhoods, about 20 minutes or so, off campus, hitting up the local garage sales hoping to score on some good deals from ignorant parents. I ended up picking up a copy of Pokemon Stadium, GoldenEye, hell yeah, F-Zero, and two other controllers for two dollars. Satisfied, I began to drive out of the neighbourhood when one last house caught my attention. I still have no idea why it did. There were no cars there, and only one table was set up with random junk on it but something sort of drew me there. I usually trust my gut on these things, so I got out of the car and I was greeted by an old man. His outward appearance was, for lack of a better word, displeasing. It was odd. If you asked me to tell you why I thought he was displeasing, I couldn't really pinpoint anything. There was just something about him that put me on edge. I can't explain it. All I can tell you is that if it wasn't in the middle of the afternoon, and there weren't other people within shouting distance, I would not have even thought of approaching this man. He flashed a crooked smile at me, and asked what I was looking for, and immediately I noticed that he must be blind in one of his eyes. His right eye had that glazed over look about it. I forced myself to look to his left eye instead trying not to offend, and asked him if he had any old video games. I was already wondering how I could politely excuse myself from the situation when he would tell me he had no idea what a video game was, but to my surprise, he said he had a few ones in an old box. He assured me he'd be back in a jiffy, and turned to head back into the garage. As I watched him hobble away, I couldn't help but notice what he was selling on his table. Littered across his table were rather peculiar paintings, various artworks that looked like ink blots that a psychiatrist might show you. Curious, I looked through them. It was obvious why no one was visiting this guy's garage sale. These weren't exactly aesthetically pleasing. As I came to the last one, for some reason it looked almost like Majora's Mask. The same heart-shaped body with little spikes protruding outward. Initially, I just thought that since I was secretly hoping to find the game at these garage sales, some Freudian bullshit was projecting itself into the ink blots. But given the events that happened afterwards, I'm not so sure now. I should have asked the man about it. I wish I would have asked the man about it. After staring at the Majora-shaped blot, 
I looked up, and the old man was suddenly there again, arm's length in front of me, smiling at me. I'll admit, I jumped out of reflex and laughed nervously as he handed me a Nintendo 64 cartridge. It was the standard grey colour, except that someone had written Majora on it in black permanent marker. I got butterflies in my stomach as I realised what a coincidence this was and asked him how much he wanted for it. The old man smiled at me and told me I could have it for free, that it used to belong to a kid who was about my age and that he didn't live here anymore. There was something weird how the man phrased that, but I didn't really pay any attention to it then. I was too caught up in not only finding this game, but getting it for free. I reminded myself to be a bit sceptical, since this looked like a pretty shady cartridge and there's no guarantee it would work, but then the optimism inside of me interjected that maybe it was some kind of beta version or pirated version of the game and that was all I needed to be back on Cloud9. I thanked the man, and the man smiled at me and wished me well, saying, Goodbye then. At least, that's what it sounded like to me. All the way in the car ride home, I had a nagging doubt that the man had said something else. My fears were confirmed when I booted up the game. To my surprise, it worked just fine, and there was one save file named simply Ben. Goodbye, Ben, he was saying. Goodbye, Ben. I felt bad for the man, obviously a grandparent, and obviously going senile, and I, for some reason or another, reminded him of his grandson, Ben. Out of curiosity, I looked at the save file, eyeballing it. I could tell that it was pretty far in the game. He had almost all of the masks, and three of four remains of the bosses. I noticed that he had used an owl statue to save his game. He was on day three, and by the Stone Tower Temple, with hardly an hour left before the moon would crash. I remember thinking that it was a shame that he had come so close to beating the game that he had never finished it. I made a new save file named Link, out of tradition, and started the game, ready to relive my childhood. For such a shady looking game cartridge, I was impressed at how smoothly it ran, literally just like a retail copy of the game, save for a few minor hiccups here and there like textures being where they shouldn't be, random flashes of cutscenes at odd intervals, but nothing too bad. However, the only thing that was a little unnerving was that at times, the NPCs would call me Link, and at other times, they would call me Ben. I figured it was just a bug, a fluke in the programming causing our files to get mixed up or something. It did kind of creep me out though, after a while, and it was around after I had beaten the Woodfall Temple that I regrettably went into the save files and deleted Ben. I had intended to preserve the file just out of respect of the game's original owner, it's not like I needed two files anyway, hoping that would solve the problem. It did, and it didn't. Now NPCs wouldn't call me anything. Where my name should be in the dialogue, there was just a blank space. My save file name was still called Link though. Frustrated and with homework to do, I put the game down for a day. I started playing the game again last night, getting the lens of truth and working my way towards completing the Snowhead Temple. Now some of you more hardcore Majora's Mask players know about the fourth day glitch. For those who don't know, you can google it, but the gist of it is that right as the clock is about to hit 0000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 on the final day, you can talk to the astronomer and look through the telescope. 
if you time it right, the countdown disappears and you essentially have another day to finish whatever you were doing. Deciding to do the glitch to try and finish the Snowhead Temple, I happened to get it right on the first try and the time counter at the bottom disappeared. However, when I pressed B to exit the telescope, instead of being greeted by the astronomer, I found myself in the Majora boss fight room at the end of the game, the trippy boxed in area. Staring at Skull Kid hovering above me, there was no sound, just him floating in the air above me, and the background music which was regular for the area, but still creepy. Immediately my palms began to sweat. This was definitely not normal. Skull Kid never appeared here. I tried moving around the area, and no matter where I went, Skull Kid would always be there, facing me, looking at me, not saying anything. Nothing would happen though, and this kept up for around 60 seconds. I thought the game had bugged or something, but I was beginning to doubt that very much. I was about to reach for the reset button when text appeared on my screen. You're not sure why, but you apparently had a reservation. I instantly recognised that text. You get that message when you get the room key from Anju at the Stockpot Inn. But why was it playing here? I refused to entertain the notion that it was almost as if the game was trying to communicate with me. I started to navigate the room again, testing to see if it was some sort of trigger that enabled me to interact with something there. When I realised how stupid I was, to even think that someone could program the game like this was absurd. Sure enough, 15 seconds later, Another message appeared on the screen, and again, like the first one, it was already a pre-existing phase. Go to the lair of the temple's boss. Yes, slash no. I paused for a second, contemplating what I should press, and how the game would react. When I realised that I couldn't select no, taking a deep breath, I pressed yes, and the screen faded to white, with the words, dawn of a new day, with the subtext, 11111111, beneath it. Where I was ported to filled me with the most intense sense of dread and impending fear I had ever experienced. The only way I can describe the way I felt here is having this feeling of inexplicable depression on a profound scale. I am normally not a depressed person, but the way I felt here was a feeling that I didn't even know existed. It was such a twisted, powerful presence that seemed to wash over me. I appeared in some kind of Twilight Zone version of Clock Town. I walked out of the clock tower, as you normally do when you start from day one, only to find that all the inhabitants were gone. Usually with the fourth day glitch, you can still find the guards and the dog that runs around outside the tower. This time, they were all gone. What replaced them was the ominous feeling that there was something out there in the same area as me, and it was watching me. I had four hearts to my name and the hero's bow, but at this point, I wasn't even concerned about my avatar. I felt that I personally was in some kind of danger. Perhaps the most chilling thing was the music. It was the song of healing, ripped straight from the game itself but played in reverse. The music would get louder, building up as if you should expect something to pop out at you, but nothing did, and the constant loop began to wear on my mental state. 
Every now and then, I would hear the faint laugh of the happy mask salesman in the background. Just quiet enough, so I wasn't sure if I was hearing things, but just loud enough to keep me determined to find him. I looked in all four zones of Clocktown, only to find nothing. No one. Textures were missing. West Clocktown had me walking on air. The entire area felt broken. Hopelessly broken. As the reverse Song of Healing repeated for what felt like the 50th time, I just remember standing in the middle of South Clocktown, realising that I had never felt so alone in a video game before. As I walked through the ghost town, I don't know whether it was the combination of the out-of-place textures and the atmosphere and the haunting melody of the once peaceful and soothing song being butchered and distorted, but I was literally on the verge of tears, and I had no idea why. I hardly ever cry. Something had gripped me here, and this powerful sense of depression was both foreign and crippling. I tried leaving Clocktown, but every time I attempted to zone out, the screen would fade to black, and I would just zone in to another part of Clocktown. I tried playing my ocarina. I wanted to escape, and I did not want to be here. But every time I played the Song of Time, or Song of Soaring, it would only say, your notes echo far, but nothing happens. By this point, it was obvious the game didn't want me to leave, but I had no idea why it was keeping me here. I didn't want to go inside the buildings. I felt that I would be too vulnerable there, to whatever I was terrified of. I don't know why, but I came up with the idea that maybe if I drowned myself at the laundry pool, I could spawn somewhere else and leave this place. As I zoned in and ran towards the pool, that's when it happened. Link grabbed his head, and the screen flashed for a brief moment of the happy mask salesman smiling at me. Not Link. Me. With the Skull Kid scream playing in the background. And when the screen returned, I was staring at the Link statue from playing the song Elegy of Emptiness. I screamed as the thing just stared back at me with the haunting facial expression. I turned around and ran out and back into South Clocktown. And to my horror, the damn statue followed me. In the only way I can compare this is like the Weeping Angels from Doctor Who. Every so often, at random intervals, the animation would play of the statue appearing behind me. It was like the thing was chasing me. Or, I don't even want to say it, haunting me. By this point, I was on the verge of hysterics but not even once did the thought of turning off the console occur to me. I don't know why. I was so wrapped up in it. The terror felt all so real. I tried to shake the statue, but it would literally appear right behind me every single time. Link started to make weird animations I had never seen him do before. He would flail his arms around, or spasm randomly, and the screen would cut to the happy mask salesman, smiling again for a brief moment, before I was face to face with the damn statue again. I ended up running into the Swordmaster's dojo, and ran to the back. I don't know why, but in my panic, I just wanted some kind of assurance that I'm not alone here. To my dismay, I found no one. But as I turned to leave, the statue cornered me in the cubby in the back. I tried attacking the statue with my sword, but to no avail. 
confused and backed into a corner. I just stared at the statue, waiting for it to kill me. Suddenly the screen flashed again to the happy mask salesman, and Link turned to face my screen. Standing upright, mirroring the statue, looking at me along with his copy, literally staring at me. Whatever was left of the fourth wall was completely shattered while I ran out of the dojo terrified. Suddenly, the game warps me to an underground tunnel, and the reverse Song of Healing queued up again, as I was given a brief moment of rest before the statue started appearing behind me again, this time aggressively. I could only take a few steps before it would summon behind me again. I hurriedly made my way out of the tunnel and appeared in southern Clocktown. As I ran aimlessly in a sheer panic, suddenly a redead screamed and the screen faded to black as dawn of a new day and 1111111 appeared again. The screen faded in, and I was standing on top of Clock Tower, with Skull Kid hovering over me again, silent. I looked up, and the moon was back, looming just meters above my head. But the Skull Kid just stared at me hauntingly with that damn mask. A new song was playing. The Stone Temple theme played in reverse. In some sort of desperate attempt, I equipped my bow and fired off a shot at the Skull Kid. It actually hit him, and he played an animation of him reeling back. I fired again, and on the third arrow, a text box appeared, saying, That won't do you any good. <laughs> and I was picked up off the ground, levitated upwards on my back. And then Link screamed as he burst into flames, instantly killing him. I jumped when this happened. I had never seen this move used by anyone in the game, and Skull Kid himself didn't have any moves. As the death screen played, my lifeless body still burning, the Skull Kid laughed and the screen faded to black only to have me reappear in the same place. I decided to charge him, but the same thing happened. Link's body was lifted off the ground by some unknown force, and he immediately burst into flames, again killing him. This time, during the death screen, the faint sounds of the reverse Song of Healing could be heard. On my third, and final try, I noticed there was no music playing this time, that all there was was eerie silence. I remembered that in the original encounter with the Skull Kid, you were supposed to use the ocarina, either travel back in time or summon the giant. I attempted to play the Song of Time, but before I could hit the last note, Link's body once again horrifically exploded into flames he died. As the death screen neared its end, it began to chug, as if the cartridge was trying to process a lot of something. When the screen came to, it was the same scene as the first three times, except this time, Link was lying on the ground dead in a position I had never seen in the game before. His head was tilted towards the camera, with the Skull Kid floating above him. I couldn't move. I couldn't press any buttons. All I could do was just stare at Link's dead body. After around 30 seconds of this, the game simply fades out with the message, You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? before kicking you out to the title screen. 
Upon getting back to the title screen and starting again, I noticed my save file was no longer there. Instead of Link, it was replaced with Your Turn. Your Turn had three hearts, zero masks, and no items. I selected Your Turn, and immediately when I did, I was returned to the clock tower rooftop scene of my Link dead and to the Skull Kid hovering over with the Skull Kid's laugh looping again and again. I quickly hit the reset button, and when the game booted up again, there was one more save file added below your turn, entitled Ben. Ben's save file is right back where it was before I deleted it. At the Stone Tower Temple, with the moon almost crashing. I turned the game off at this point. I'm not superstitious, but this was way too messed up, even for me. I haven't played it at all today. Hell, I didn't even get any sleep last night. I kept hearing the reverse song of healing music in my head, and just remembered the sense of dread I felt exploring Clocktown. I drove back to the man's house today to ask him some questions with a buddy of mine. No way I was going there alone. Only to find that there's a for sale sign in the front yard. And when I rang the door, no one was home. So now I'm back here, writing down the rest of my thoughts and recording what happened. Sorry if some of this has grammatical errors and whatnot. I'm running on no sleep here. I'm terrified of this game. Even more so now that I relived it a second time, writing this all down. But I feel like there's still more to it than meets the eye, and that there's something calling to me to investigate this further. I think Ben is something in this equation, but I don't know what. And if I could get a hold of the old man, then I would be able to find out some answers. I need another day or so to recuperate before tackling this game again. It's already taken a toll on my sanity, I feel like. But next time I do this, I'm going to be recording my footage all the way through. The idea to record only came to me towards the end, so you see the last few minutes of what I saw, including Skull Kid and the Elegy statue, but it's on YouTube now. I'm going to stay in this thread for a little while longer before I fall asleep to answer any questions you guys might have, or hopefully listen to your ideas or theories to help me shed some light into this, or maybe things I should try to do. I think I'm going to play Ben's file tomorrow to see what happens. Maybe I was supposed to do that all along. I don't believe in paranormal stuff, but this is pretty messed up. But maybe this Ben guy is just a really good hacker or programmer. I don't want to think about the alternatives if he isn't. That's the end of the copy-paste. I'm hoping that maybe this is some kind of running gag the developers had, and that other people have gotten gag or hacked copies of the game like this. This just really scares me. The Hooded Man Have you ever been influenced by clothing? I don't mean confidence by looks. Have you ever been given more control than ever by an item? Or a truth? Or just a favourite shirt? Have you ever been influenced in the worst way by showing the truth? The following is taken directly from journal entries. The entries were written by a notorious but unknown killer. He is notorious in the means that everybody has seen his work. He is unknown because nobody knows that he has done it. His origin is unusual. No troubles, no evil family, 
no magic or paranormal forces. His life was chosen by him, and him alone. His identity is also unknown. He will be named from here on as the Hooded Man. April 3rd, 2004 It's been really cold around here. I don't have anything really to cover myself. All I have are my t-shirts and jeans. So today, I decided to get a jacket. I was just in a local store. Nothing special. It's a yellow hoodie with some black lining. I think it looks pretty cool, and when I tried it on, the attendant said it suited me fine. I said thanks, to be polite. Common courtesy is so hard to find. So I bought it. I haven't taken it off yet. Not only is it warm, but I can really see myself doing amazing things in it. When I look at the mirror, I smirk. I feel amazing. I can't really explain it, but I like it. I really like it. I feel the need to put my hood up. Something about the hood has a way of masking a person. Even though it shows their face, it hides something somewhere. It's really late now. I've been feeling so great all day. Time flew around me. I'll have to explain more tomorrow. April 10th. I've had a hell of a week. I felt so great. I walked the halls like a big shot. I'm sure I looked smug. That's why Jack challenged me. He was so angry. Whoever knew ignoring an insult was more insulting than responding with shrewd comments about someone's family. He antagonized me. He asked for it. He threw a hard punch and I stood. It stung harder than before when I actually argued with him. I felt so cool or weak, my confidence kept me up. I punched him hard in the stomach and I lifted him up with an uppercut. It felt so good. It really did. Parents calling. April 14th. Jack still isn't out of the hospital. They said he's in a lot of pain. He spit a lot of blood. His parents told me over the phone. I reflected on it, on how great it felt when my fist connected, how his cracked scream sounded. That's good to hear, I said blankly. I don't care about Jack. I smiled at his pain. I keep staring. I keep staring at my mirror. I'm always wearing my favourite hoodie. It feels so... empowering. My friends would laugh at what I say. They would compare me to Spider-Man and his black suit. Spider-Man threw his power away. I don't plan on doing anything with my source of confidence. April 22nd. Jack has gone to a better place. The words rang through my ears. He's dead. He lost too much blood. His father told me the day I visited that he was losing blood due to a personal health condition. But the way his mother looked at me told me the real story. I killed him. I still remember the satisfaction of hitting him, watching his head hit the concrete as he fell down. I never wanted to kill him. I need to think about what I've done, right? That'll fix my feelings. But what is there to think about? Regret is a foolish emotion. I don't need regret. April 24th. Dad has been avoiding me lately, and Mum just tells me she loves me. They both want me to feel endless guilt, but I won't. Or rather, I can't. I can fake it for the public, but the truth is, I'm not sorry. 
Spider-Man's story is starting to make me think more. But why would a cursed or possessed hoodie land in my possession? Everybody who knew Jack glares at me. Everyone who I would talk to have either transferred themselves out of my class or went to a different school. Teachers don't look at me much or get on to me if I'm breaking any rule. Today, I threw a pencil at my history teacher. It hit his shoulder. He just froze for a second and continued what he was doing. Everyone either hates me and probably wants me dead, or they fear me. My writing is the only comfort I have. I can be at peace and let myself go. April 25th. They provoked me. They threatened me. I had no choice. They would have killed me. My hood protected my face. The knife naturally moved from Rob's hand to mine. I didn't mean to. The writing was a short line at this point. April 30th. Five days. Five days being interrogated and sleeping in a cell. They decided I was only defending myself. I can hear mum and dad talking. They want me gone. They're both scared. I was an idiot to think that this jacket of mine was possessing me or changing my personality. It's just a really cool jacket. I love how it looks. I feel like such a badass. I remember how I put the hood up. I put it up when Jack challenged me. I put it up when those guys tried to kill me. I feel no remorse. I feel indifferent. I am in control. I have finally come to realize my insanity. I wanted to kill them. All of them. I needed only a push and the confidence to fight. I got it. Mum and Dad are irritating me. They all irritate me. Maybe I'll go down to the store later and pick up a mask. Then my victims will never see it coming. The Last Train Home Do you ever watch other people in the subway? It's so strange to have to ignore someone who's right up there in your face. A can of sardines spring to mind. Except passengers aren't joined by a bond or thick oil or brine. Instead, they're stewing in a miasma of sweat, cologne and annoyance. Everybody absorbed in their own little worlds, warm little cocoons. There, whizzing through the bowels of the city at a brisk clip, you'll find people reading books, newspapers, maybe on an iPad or a smartphone. Except me. I'll always be looking through the thick glass windows at the flickering blackness just beyond. Sometimes, late at night, I hope I'll get on the same train once more so I can see it all again. It had been one of those weeks, actually, it had been one of those months, where the targets piled up like so much dirty laundry. The boss was on my case, miserable, balding fart with his mortgage and his European sports car riding us all for another bullshit project for some client across the country. The days and nights lost their meaning. In at work early to beat the crowd. Heading home without even seeing the light of the sun. Caffeine was my only friend. The last thing on the agenda for the workday was the mad sprint for the last train home because the miserable bastard wouldn't even sign off on the late night taxi claims. It showed up on the work-life balance indicators 
he'd said. It had been another mindless day of numbers, presentation slides, and text. To be frank, I didn't even know if the version of the mindless report I was working on was the fifth or the fiftieth. Nor could I have told you the difference between the two. The office had already emptied out an hour before, my last co-workers giving me a commiserating pat on the back as they headed off. I cursed as I stuffed my laptop and swept some papers into my bag. I was going to miss the train. The stale warmth of the building gave way to the bitter cold as I hit the streets running. The station was deserted. Not unthinkable at this time of the night, but eerie all the same. There's something about a hollow space meant for crowds. I'm not talking about muggers or anything like that. There is an air of the forbidden about these empty spaces. That's how that night started out. Expectant, waiting for something to happen. Not that I cared at the time. The escalators were out for the night. I was wheezing hard by the time I got to the bottom. That old college fitness, long drowned under an ocean of booze, buried under a mountain of fast food. I thought the last train had already left, resigning myself to a long wait for an expensive taxi ride back. I was about to leave, when a train pulled up, with the familiar scream of metal on metal. Graffiti adorned the grey skin of the train, tribal tattoos for the modern locomotive. The doors hissed, warm air belched out from the cabin. I got in. The train, strangely, was full. Not packed, but it was crowded, I found myself a seat in between an old man in a large brown overcoat and young lady that was wearing a dark formal dress, a large flower pinned to her breast, her face a mask of mascara and eyeshadow inexpertly applied. Across from me sat a pair of army guys in fatigues, their scalps shining pink under their tight buzz cuts, and many more besides. It was a puzzling thing to have a cabin so full late at night and with such a motley crew of inhabitants. With a shudder, the train pulled out from the station. I settled back contentedly into my seat. The network connection in the tunnels was never dependable. I had to find another way to entertain myself on the ride home. The noise from the screech of the rails and the rush of air outside seemed muted. Instead, the cabin was filled with a soft susurrus, the hushed tones of a crowd in a theatre, expectant but subdued. The cabin felt colder than it should have been. Was the heating out again? It couldn't be. I was certain that the cabin was warmer than the platform a second ago. Yet now, it felt like I was back outside, in the howling cold. I tugged my jacket a little tighter. I looked at the hodgepodge of strange individuals in the cabin. Everybody seemed out of place. Why would there be a gaggle of high school kids, obviously inebriated, this late at night? Or the wayfish girl that was wearing what seemed to be a school uniform? I shifted uncomfortably on the sculpted plastic seat. Not a single mobile phone or any other electric device in sight. A strange sight in this day and age. I looked up at the row of LED lights that indicated the train's progress along my route. Four more stops. I was still staring at the display when the train whizzed by the next station. It didn't stop. Didn't even slow down. Just kept going right. 
The lights and pillars of the station streamed by in a blur. I jerked upright in my seat, my eyes widening. What kind of train had I gotten onto? The rest of the crowd was unfazed by this development. If anything, the low buzz of whispers got even louder as the train progressed. We were still hurtling through the dark tunnel, the overhead lights flickering on and off, when the little girl in the school uniform affixed me, stared at me, wide-eyed. She crept over to the group of high schoolers and tugged at the sleeves of one of the young men. He must have been a basketball player, towering over his companions. He nearly had to bend double to bring his ear down to the little girl's face. Her jaw worked up and down as she whispered something to him urgently. I heard nothing over the sound of the train. He blinked and took a step back when he looked back in my direction, as though seeing me for the first time. His handsome face twisted strangely. What was it? Anger? No, he looked like he wanted something. He looked hungry. His compatriots noticed the break in the conversation and directed their gazes to the focus of his attention. To me. The same gamut of emotions cycled through their faces. Shock, and then a sharpening, a hardening of their features. They were hungry too. The giant took a step forward, perhaps meaning some harm for some slight on his person that I must have committed. One of the high school girls held him back. The feeling spread through the cabin, like a spark arcing from person to person. The two uniformed men looked up and tightened their jaws. The old man next to me perked up and scooted down another seat so he could look at me without straining his neck. Outside, a blur of lights told me that another station had shot by. Three more stops. I shrank back in my seat, the tendons straining at the surface of my hands as I clutched at my bag protectively, as though that stupid gesture, grabbing on my work, the focus of my life, would ground me and take me from this nightmare. It didn't. I felt the weight of their eyes on me, like insects crawling over my skin. Something was wrong, so clearly wrong. This strange crowd, so different, yet each of them was wearing that naked need on their faces. Don't mind them, they're just jealous of you. The young lady by my side, her voice was soft, Mellifluous. Don't stare back, and don't talk to them. I turned to look at my erstwhile companion. What are they jealous of? I just wanted to catch the last train home. It's the last train home for all of us, too. She smiled. She was very pale. Very beautiful. But not all of them want to be here. And looking at you, going home tonight, makes them so very unhappy. Where'd they all come from? Was there a convention? A meeting? I cast my eyes around the cabin again, but was stopped halfway by her strong fingers on my chin. Her fingers were icy cold. She turned my head around to face her. Everywhere. All around, most of them didn't want to be here, except me. Maybe I'd had enough of where I was. I miss my parents. I hadn't seen them in such a long time. It took a while for me to gather enough courage to go look for them. She paused, suddenly pensive at what she'd said. You're not meant to be here, you know. You're on the wrong train. This isn't your ride. 
Outside the window, another station went by. My eyes flicked back to the board with all the little light. Two stops to home. The whispering in the cabin had started up again, louder than before, but still muffled by the sounds of the rails and the rushing air outside. They were talking about me. The atmosphere grew oppressive. The attention of the crowd felt like a rock on my chest. A vice. My breathing grew laboured. Each inhalation a struggle. I wheezed. My companion sensed my discomfort. I wish I could help, she said sadly. It'll stop when we get to the end of the line, I suppose. Her eyes lit up at the thought. She turned around and scooted up onto the seat, her knees on the hard plastic, palms on the cold glass. Even with her face pressed up against the glass, there wasn't a trace of fog on the window left by her breath, if she was even breathing at all. Here... Why don't you take this? I won't need it where I'm going. She fumbled at her dress, detached the white flower, and pressed it into my hands. The sweet smell of the flower took my attention away from the pain in my chest. We're here. She was quivering with excitement as the train began to slow. I looked up at the board overhead. All the lights on the map had gone out. Where were we? She cupped my chin with her hands. It was only then, with her arm so close to my face, that I saw the network of fine white lines that crisscrossed her forearms. She caught the flick of my eyes towards her arms. She shrugged, sheepish. Practice makes perfect she said. She frowned, suddenly serious again. This stop is for the rest of us. You can't join us. You have to stay here. She leaned forward quickly and gave me a kiss on my cheek. Her cold lips burnt like an ice cube. The people in the cabin quickly turned their attention to the approaching platform. I felt the weight on my chest ease. The whispering grew to a crescendo as they pointed and chatted excitedly. The platform grew close. And what a sight it was. I didn't recognise the tiles or posters. I must have taken this train a thousand times. I could have closed my eyes and named every station in order and the time between stations if I wanted to. And yet, I was lost. There was nothing on the platform that helped me in any way. No signs, no directions. What the platform had was people. A milling sea of heads and faces, all expectant, all eagerly waiting. When the door opened, it let in the roar of a crowd outside. Shouts, shrieks and yells, and tears. So many tears. The passengers burst out of the train, throwing themselves into the waiting sea of people. I saw one of the army boys embracing an older gentleman, also dressed in military fatigues. None of that new age stuff, that pixelated camouflage. This was old school with big green and brown blotches. The resemblance between the two was clear. They parted. The younger man introduced his father to his compatriot. The older man hugged him as tightly as he had hugged his own son earlier. The group of teenagers whoop and leapt as they pushed through the crowd, seeking some new adventure for the night. I caught a last glimpse of the blonde locks of the baseball player as they vanished around a corner. The old man that was sitting by me had found an elegant looking lady in her thirties, 
Her light sundress looks out of place for the biting cold of winter. Or had I mistaken the man for someone else? I looked again, and it wasn't the old man anymore, but a young couple laughing in the prime of their lives. No, it was the same coat, and his features, lined with a jealous greed scant moments ago, were now lit with a fierce joy. Just as the train doors hissed shut, I saw the girl that sat next to me on the train. She was in tears with her arms around a well-dressed couple. She waved at me as the train pulled out of the station. I waved back. My legs shook as I got off the train at my stop. The platform was reassuringly deserted. I watched as the train screeched into the distant darkness of the tunnel. I gingerly touched the numb spot on my neck where the girl had kissed me. My fingers came away wet. I didn't even remember the tears falling. My nose was suddenly assaulted by a rich, thick greenhouse scent decaying plant matter. I fished out the white flower from my coat pocket, where the strange girl had left it. The pristine white petals were dry to the point of crumbling and speckled black with rot. I let it fall from my fingers and watched it bounce on the station floor. It sat there, like an unmelting snowflake, on the pocked grey concrete. I stared at it for a long time, before I began the long trek home. Why I never use Street View on Google Maps Some people ask me why I never use the Street View function on Google Maps. They say things like, how will you know what the place looks like? Or... Don't you want to see more than just bird's eye view of the place? I usually reply by saying, it's always better to go outside and see things with your own eyes, which usually ends in them commending me for my confidence. Truth be told, the reason I say that is not because of confidence. On the contrary, it's because of fear. To understand where I'm coming from, I need to tell you the story of how I first found out about Google Maps. I was in elementary school at the time, and during computer class, instead of doing the assigned project, my friends and I were fooling around on CoolMathGames.com. We were playing Fireboy and Watergirl when one of my friends started to speak. Hey, you guys hear of Google Maps? Yeah, my parents use it all the time. But did you know, you can actually see the places on the map? Like, you're actually there? My 12-year-old brain thought that sounded amazing. I let my friend pull up Google Maps on my computer. Then he asked me for a place I wanted to see. Hmm, how about our school? Really? School? Really? Yeah, I want to see how it looks. After typing in the address of our school, my friend dragged his little yellow stick man onto the school address and opened up Street View. I was mesmerised by the pictures on the screen. It felt so surreal to be able to navigate and look around as if you were really there. I could see everything. Even from the broken swings at the playground, to the concrete stairs that led to the front door. Something about being able to see things without actually being there appealed to my young mind. Oh, 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 do you know you can see your own house too? Here, let me show you my house. My friend typed his address and pulled up Street View on his house. I visited his place many times before, and the house looked just as in real life. The yellow exterior, the white fences at the front, the garden at the side... Google Maps gave a perfect recreation of my friend's abode. While we were sitting there, snickering at my friend's house, the bell rang, 
and it was time to go home. After school, I did my usual routine of going home, searching the pantry for anything to eat, then going up to my room and playing on the computer. I didn't have any homework that night, and my parents said they were going to be home late, so I had the house all to myself. As a kid, I decided the best thing to do was play flash games as late into the evening as I could. Eventually, I got bored of playing flash games and wondered what I should do. It was just past 6pm, but it was dark outside already. I looked out of my bedroom window and saw all the houses in my neighbourhood with lights shining through their windows. Suddenly, I remembered about the Google Maps thing my friend showed me at school that day. I eagerly opened the Google Maps and typed in my address, then I opened up Street View. The image of my house covered my screen. I had a fun time dragging the camera around and seeing everything. I even zoomed into the living room window, imagining that maybe I would see someone if I zoomed in enough. Of course, the window was too blurry after I zoomed in that much. I decided to zoom out again and take a look at my house as a whole. It was then that I noticed something odd. There was a man wearing a hoodie near my side gate. I tried zooming in on the man's face, but I could only see the back of his head. For context, the side of my childhood house has a gate that leads into the backyard. Right above that gate was my bedroom window. Being an imaginative child, and given it was dark outside, I rushed to my window and pulled back the curtains, expecting to see someone scary when I looked down. I sighed in relief. Of course, there was no one by the side gate. When I got back on my computer, I was greeted by a horrifying sight. The image of a man's crooked face with eyes bulging and a cartoonishly white smile. I never zoomed out from the man's face before checking the window, so his face filled my whole screen. I instantly zoomed out. I wanted to close my browser, but I was afraid that if I did, the man would go away. Since I zoomed out, I got to see the man's full body. The best way to describe the man was tall, lanky, and crooked. He had a hoodie on, and his hands were in his hoodie pockets. His head was tilted to one side, and his eyes were staring directly at the screen. What really scared me was how his entire torso was facing the screen, as if he knew I was looking at him. The Street View images were all taken during the day, so I reasoned to myself that even if there was a smiling man outside, it could not possibly be happening at this moment. After all, it was already dark out. I looked at the date the image was taken, and saw that it was taken months ago. I then looked again outside my window, just to confirm no one was at the side gate. Thus, I was reassured there was no way the man was currently outside my house. When I looked back at the computer, my eyes widened. The man stood just as he did moments ago, except one of his hands was outside of his pockets. This hand was giving me a thumbs down. All this time, the man was still staring directly at the screen with his bulging eyes and absurdly wide smile. I darted downstairs and made sure all the doors and windows were locked. I closed all the curtains for all the windows, then locked myself in my room. When I looked back at my computer, I saw the man's face was no longer smiling. Now, it was laughing. I considered closing the browser, but I was deathly afraid of what would happen if I did so. Clearly it seemed that the man was responding to what I was doing. So, I was left staring at his image on my screen. After a few minutes of staring at the man, and making sure I didn't take my eyes off of him, 
my computer got the blue screen of death. Panicking, I quickly unplugged my computer and plugged it back in, trying to restart it. The screen came alive and showed the Windows XP boot up screen. There was nothing but silence through the entire house. I sat there, looking at the boot up screen, wanting nothing more to get back onto Google Maps to make sure the man was still there. Back then, PCs took a very long time to load. Suddenly, I heard the doorknob to my front door start jiggling. I feared for the worst. Was that the man? I looked back at my computer and it was still booting up. The jiggling stopped. Then, I heard the familiar creaking sound of my front door opening. My heart was racing in my chest, and my hands were trembling. I knew that the door to my room was locked, but if the man could get through the front door, he could just as easily get through the door to my room. Then I heard Mum's voice calling out, We're home! All the tension I had suddenly disappeared, and I raced downstairs to see my parents taking off their shoes at the front door. I frantically told them about what happened regarding the man, and they didn't believe me. I practically dragged them to my room and opened up Google Maps Street View for our house, expecting to see the familiar jagged smile. However, the man wasn't there. I zoomed in and out all over my house and could find no trace of the man. I kept insisting that he was there, but my parents did not believe me. They said that even if the man was there, there was no way it could have happened in real time since the photos were taken months ago. The next day, I told my friends the story at lunchtime, and while it scared them for a moment, they eventually forgot about the story. I never forgot what happened that night. The memory of the man's crooked smile and bulging eyes come back to me whenever I consider opening up Street View on Google Maps. So now, whenever someone asks me why I never use Street View, I simply tell them that I would rather see things with my own eyes than trust whatever image is on the screen. Lifeless Lucy When a story starts with, it started with a wonderful day, do you automatically think it will end well? Well, in this story, the ending is much more depressing. This sad story is about a young eight-year-old girl whose life got cut short. It happened on a wonderful, sunny day. A young blonde girl was playing with her two friends. So what's your party going to be like, Lucy? A girl with wavy red hair, green eyes and freckles named Judy asked. Well, Mama said it's going to be a big one, Lucy replied. Oh, oh, what kind of cake are you getting? The second girl with medium dark skin, black curly hair and dark brown eyes named Eliza continued. Well, Daddy wants me to get a red velvet for tea cake, Lucy continued. Mmm, that sounds so good, Judy exclaimed. Yeah, and so many people are going to be there, Lucy said with excitement. You know, Lucy, I hope you're getting a dress that will fit perfectly with your cute bow, Eliza said. Yeah, Daddy picked a beautiful light blue dress for me. Alex went to pick it up today, Lucy smiled. As the kids were playing with giggles and smiles, a car pulled in the driveway, and a guy in a suit with short reddish brown hair holding a dress walked towards the kids. He stared at the little girls with a frown. Stupid rich brat, he uttered under his breath. Once he saw that Lucy turned her head towards him, he forced a smile on his face and walked up to her. He hated that his family has to work for the Joneses' family. It's been like that for generations, 
whose father was the butler to Mr. Jones, Lucy's father. Now he was Lucy's butler. Lucy wasn't always stubborn, or even acted spoiled for a rich kid. Alex just hated the fact that he had to take orders from a little seven-year-old girl. Hey, Alex. Lucy ran up to him. Hey, Lucy. How are you and your friends today? He faked a smile. We're all doing good, Lucy smiled. Is that my dress? Lucy glanced at the dress. Yes, it is. It's dry cleaned, ready for your birthday in a few weeks. He pats her head. Can I try it on? Lucy jumped up and down. I don't think your mother would like that. Alex started to walk. Oh, please. I really want to try it on. Alex started to get annoyed. This is why he hates her. She never takes no for an answer. Alex then grinned. He guessed it was time for the plan to take action. He turned to face Lucy. Oh, Lucy, let's go see how your birthday dress looks on you. He grabbed her hand and walked her to her room. Here's your dress. I'll stay out here so you can change, he smiled. Okay, be right back. Lucy ran inside her room to change. After a while, Lucy walked out of her room with a smile. Look, Alex, doesn't the dress look beautiful? Lucy twirled. Yes, it does. He stared at her with annoyance. Hey, Lou, let's go show your friends. Alex showed a warm smile. Yeah! Lucy started to walk, until Alex suddenly knocked her out with a chloroform-soaked napkin. Alex held her and snuck out to his car. He put Lucy in the back seat and buckled her up. He moved back and smirked. Don't worry, Lucy. You'll love where you're going. He moved to the front seat and started to drive away from the house. As time went on, Lucy could hear people talking. She noticed that one of the voices was Alex. She slowly picked up her head and noticed she was in a cage. What is this? Where am I? Lucy said, scared. Oh, hello Lucy. How nice of you to join this small conversation. Alex walked to her with a grin. Lucy looked his way to see him and a man who looked to be in his late forties with short, messy, dark brown hair and dark brown eyes. He was big boned and looked like he hadn't showered in weeks. Alex, I thank you for another servant. This one seems to be perfect for my chores. The man smiled. Oh really? Let me guess, the other one I gave you didn't work out right again. Alex looked at him. Sadly, he didn't. The other man exclaimed. Alex, what's going on? Help me, please. Lucy started to cry out of fear. Alex just looked at Lucy and laughed. Yeah. Like I'm going to help a little brat like you. I never even liked you from the very start. Meet Christopher Gray. I give him spoiled rich kids while he gives me money. You can say that this is a side job. Have a wonderful time with your new life, Lucy. Alex started to walk away. No, Alex, don't leave me, please. Lucy sobbed as she was put in the back of a van. Alex returned back to the house. He was glad that another rich kid was gone. Now it was time to put on an act. An act that would make him look innocent. He had brought a replica of Lucy's dress and walked into the house. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, I'm back with Lucy's dress. Alex walked to them. Mrs. Jones ran up to him with tears in her eyes. Alex, please tell me you took Lucy with you to pick up the dress. Alex looked at her and tilted his head. 
Mrs. Jones? I left Lucy here. What is the matter? Sh sh she's gone. My poor baby is gone. We can't find her anywhere. She sobbed as her husband hugged her. Don't worry, sweetie. I called the cops already. They'll find our precious daughter. He stroked her hair. Don't worry, Mr. and Mrs. Jones. I'll help look for her too. Alex bowed. Thank you, Alex. Mrs. Jones sobbed. Alex walked out and went home. He stayed away from the Joneses' house for a week to make it appear as if he was searching for their daughter. I'm here in front of the Joneses' house. It's been a week since Lucy Jones disappeared. Police still haven't found a lead on the poor little girl. Mrs. Jones, do you have anything to say? The news lady put the microphone to Mrs. Jones's face. Y yes Please, whoever has my little angel, please bring her back safely. I'll give as much money as you need. I just want my little girl back. She quietly sobbed. The TV suddenly turned off. Hey brat, get to work. Break time is over. Christopher pushed Lucy to the floor. Y yes sir Lucy went to sweep the floors. She was covered in filth. Bruises, with her beautiful blue dress ripped and tattered. Her hair was also very messy. If she would do anything that Christopher didn't like, he would hit her. So Lucy tried her very best to do everything perfectly. He even taught her how to cook, and even though she wasn't that good at cooking, he still ate all the food. Lucy had been trapped in the house for a week, and she was trying to plan a way to escape. She would watch his daily routine, from when he wakes up, to eating, to shopping and sleeping. She didn't know what to do exactly, but she knew that a key was needed to the front door. She would look for any means to escape, and one day, she noticed the types of medication that he took. She read the back of one of the pill bottles and found out that one type, if taken in a certain dose, would make him drowsy. From that day forward, she would sneak his meds into his food and test how many was needed to make him fall asleep and how long it would last. For another week, she did this. The day before her birthday, she was planning to do it once again. All she wanted was to get back home to her parents. She missed them. All she wanted to do was spend her birthday with them. That was her only wish. Hey brat! Stop daydreaming and make me some food! He yelled. Lucy lightly jolted and nodded her head. She went into the kitchen to prepare him a meal, and in the process, she drugged his food. She had upped the dose this time, and after watching him eat, he soon fell asleep. She then used that opportunity to look everywhere for the key. She checked the cabinets, drawers, even in his room, but nothing. Lucy started to feel discouraged and sat down in front of the TV. She took the remote and switched it on to the news where she would see her mother talking. Mommy, I miss you so much, she lightly sobbed. Lucy got up and looked at the man. Where could he be hiding the key, she thought to herself. Out of habit, she grabbed the plate that had fallen beside him and took it to the kitchen. When she headed back, she just stared at him. Lucy jumped when he shifted on the couch. Then she noticed something in his pocket. She wondered what it was. As she slowly walked to him and put her hand in his pocket, she gulped, hoping he wouldn't wake up. When she removed and opened her hand, there it was. A key. Could this finally be it? Could she finally be leaving 
and going home. She silently walked to the door and tried to put the key in, but it wouldn't fit. She was confused. If the key didn't work here, then there must be another key. She kept the small key and looked around again, until she noticed a small keyhole to one of the drawers underneath the TV. She tested the small key, and to her surprise, it opened the drawer. When she looked inside, there was a bigger key and a small photo book. Being a curious little girl, she opened the book and looked through it to see pictures of young kids. The pictures started out normal, but as she flicked through, they got progressively more horrific. She then threw it down with a small yelp, shocked at what she had seen. She turned her head, hoping he didn't hear anything, but he was still asleep. Suppressing her fear as best she could, she grabbed the key that was next to the book and headed towards the door as quietly as she could. She held her breath as she inserted the key into the door, hoping for it to work. And it did. With a click, the door unlocked, and she swung it open. It was at that moment the house alarm went off. Christopher was a paranoid man, a man with secrets that he couldn't let get out. Abandoning all hopes of a quiet escape, Lucy sprinted out the door into the darkness of the night. Christopher had jolted upright at the sound of the house alarm. Groggy and confused, he looked around the room and noticed the open door and Lucy running out of it. That little brat! He got up shakily and ran after her. As Lucy ran through the woods at the front of his property, she tripped and fell down a small pit. When she hit the ground, her right leg broke with the bone sticking out. She cried in pain, but when she looked up, she found herself in a pit of dead bodies. Small bodies of people her age. They were in various stages of decomposition. Some were bones, while others were fresh bodies, just beginning to decay. She cried, trying to stand up, but she couldn't because of the pain. There you are, brat. A familiar voice rang out from behind her, before firm hands grabbed her and pulled her away from the pit. I hope you had a wonderful time seeing your new friends. Cause you'll be one of them soon. Christopher grinned. Lucy tried to struggle, but she couldn't get out of his grip. He dragged her all the way back into the house, where he grabbed an axe and threw her to the ground. Lucy fell to the floor with a thud, the pain of her broken leg making her whimper. She looked up and begged for mercy. I I'm sorry, sir. I won't do it ever again, she cried. Or maybe next time, you shouldn't do things you're not supposed to do. He started to beat her. As Lucy lay on the ground crying, she called out to her parents. Kid, they aren't coming for you. If they were, they would have been here by now. He raised the axe and swung it down viciously on her arm. Blood spilled everywhere as she cried out in pain. Christopher then raised the axe and swung it down on her head. It was at that moment the clock struck twelve and Lucy slumped to the floor. Her eyes had turned lifeless as she wished herself a small happy birthday. When that was done, Christopher took Lucy and her dismembered arm to the pit. After throwing in the body, 
He went to clean up the blood. When he was finished, he tried to call Alex for another kid, but he didn't pick up the phone. Annoyed, Christopher turned his attention to the TV. His eyes widened when he noticed the news headline. Alex Martinez was arrested this morning for the kidnapping of the seven, now eight-year-old Lucy Jones. In a panic, knowing that the police would be on his heels soon, Christopher started to pack his things, trying to get himself out of the house. Suddenly, his photo book was thrown next to him, empty. He looked back to see all the pictures he had taken of his victims. It was faint at first, but he started hearing child giggles. And then, he witnessed the spirits. Small, shadow-like forms flickering in and out of view. He stared hard. He could make out the features of one of them. It was Lucy. She tilted her head at him. You're a very bad man for what you did to us. You're going to regret everything you did. You won't get away with your life. Lucy said, as Christopher covered his ears in pain, as if her words were a white-hot fire ringing through his ears, and they began to bleed. Lucy then began to throw things at him in anger. With a giggle, she lightly floated around him in a circle, taunting him, making him hear the voices of his victims in his head. Stop! Stop! Please, no more! He screamed in pain. As the cops surrounded his house, they ordered him to come out. Christopher Gray, come out with your hands above your head. Before the cop could bust open the door, Christopher came running out, screaming, Please, make them stop! They won't shut up! It hurts! The cop stared at him in confusion. They then searched his house, but no sign of little Lucy. They did find his room, all messed up with stuff thrown everywhere, with the photos of his victims. As time passed, search parties found the bodies of the children, putting them in body bags, so they could be taken back to their families, and buried properly. Among the search party, was the distraught Mrs. Jones, who ran up to Lucy's dead body. No, my poor baby. She turned to Christopher. You monster! How dare you do this to her, you sick bastard! I hope you die a painful death! She fell to her knees, crying. Six weeks have passed since Christopher had been locked away. He was sent to a mental asylum for hearing voices in his head. A security camera was observing his every move. He stood in a corner of the room, wearing a straitjacket, acting calm. After a while, he started to hear the giggles of the children. His head jolted up, and he saw the kids. No, please, don't do it, he started to shake his head. The children then moved aside for Lucy. Her face was almost skull-like. Her eyes looked like they had popped out of their sockets. Dark cavities. Her teeth were sharp, with gums showing. I told you, Christopher Gray, I won't let you live. After what you did to us. Lucy let out a giggle as she pointed at him. Get him. The spirit started to hold him down. As he screamed, Lucy floated up to him. Isn't karma the best? She finished the question as she started to rip his chest open, tearing his insides out. As the blood squirted on the walls and the floor, Christopher's eyes started to grow dull, 
choking on his own blood, he fell to the floor as Lucy giggled. <laughs> Can you hear them laugh?